This is a PGE 323M. Make sure you're in the right class. PGE 323M Reservoir Engineering 3, also known as Reservoir Simulation. Right. Everybody in the right class? OK. So this is the class where we get to put everything that you learn in petrophysics and transport and Reservoir 1 and Reservoir 2. We get to put it all together. And don't worry if you don't remember all of it. We'll, we'll, re we'll recall what we need, OK? But we're going to put it together and use it to solve engineering problems in the real world or closer to the real world. So you know, the real world involves reservoirs that look something like this, not homogeneous 1D reservoirs or reservoirs laid out on a perfect five-spot pattern. That's not the real world, OK? The real world has lots of heterogeneities, lots of complexity, lots of geologic structure, and other things, right? So in order to solve these type of problems, we have to resort to simulation, computer simulation, OK? And so what we use reservoir simulation for is to answer an engineering question. And the engineering question in this context is, how much oil can we produce from a given reservoir, and how fast can we produce it, essentially? What's the optimal way that we can get the oil out of the ground? Okay, and so that's sort of at the key of everything we're going to do is that and the economics behind it, of course, right? How economically can we produce a reservoir? Okay, and so in order to do this, we're going to develop the mathematical models. You already have those in your toolbox, right? You learned them in Res One and Res Two. Okay, those are your pressure diffusivity equations for, in, uh, for single phase flow, and your multi-phase equations, right? So those are the stuff we're going to use in this class. Those are the mathematical tools that we're going to use in this class. Of course, those are described by a couple of nonlinear differential equations, right? PDEs, partial differential equations. So uh, who's ever had a class in partial differential equations? You have? PDEs, partial differential equations? Oh, OK. Maybe ordinary differential equations. I actually never had a class in partial differential equations until graduate school. Um, Turns out, most of the physics that we're interested in in engineering science are described by PDEs. But do you know how many PDEs we can actually solve in closed form, like write down a solution for? Maybe about five. Right? You know, the the heat equation in a homogeneous, you know, one dimension, two D, whatever. Right? So it's it's very very few. The point is, right? Uh, and so we have to resort to computer simulation. So th this says solution to PDs can't be found analytically. Let's say 99% of them can't be found analytically. Right? Um, so we have to solve them numerically, and that's the subject of this class. Right? So a reservoir simulator can help us answer these types of questions. You know, how should a field be developed? What is the best EOR scheme? Right? Why is the reservoir not behaving like we thought it would? Okay. Uh, I heard Dr. Bellhoff say one time that the reservoir simulator is a crystal ball. Uh, I'm not that optimistic. Right? I've been doing computer simulation for like 15, 16 years now as part of every, my everyday life. And I'm not that optimistic, not because the simulator gives the wrong answers. It computes, right? I mean, the computer's perfect at, doing, at computing, right? You, you give it some inputs, it doesn't do anything wrong. It gives you some outputs. But the reason it's not a crystal ball is because, of course, like you know, every crystal ball I've seen in the movies or whatnot, it always gives you the right answer. Right? But here, we have humans involved and engineers. And so we have to make interpretations. And there's a lot of assumptions that we make along the way. Right? So we take this very complex geology and we break it up. You know, In the geology, um, we have very smooth, or not necessarily smooth, but very heterogeneous distributions of porosity and permeability. And we make assumptions. We either smooth it out and, uh, and fit some function to it, or we break it up into discrete points and say that every one of those points has you know, x permeability, when you know, in reality, we might assign that x permeability to the size of the reservoir that's the size of this room. Right? Well, you can't go anywhere in the world and cut out a chunk of rock, a chunk of the earth, this size, and have it have one permeability or one porosity, of course. Right? So th there's assumptions all along the way. right? There's assumptions in the mathematical models that we use, right? We're not including all the physics. Right? And so uh, this is why the reservoir simulator is not a perfect tool, because as engineers, we have to make decisions and make them rapidly. We make decisions about how much complexity to include in the model. 
Right? And maybe that decision is wrong. And so we feed it to the model, out come some results, and we try to make decisions based on that. Right? So while the reservoir simulator is not a crystal ball in the sense that it's always right or always gives you the correct physical results, because the physical results are the experiment. They're what you see in the field. Right? Okay? While it's not always that, what it can do for you is it can allow you to ask lots of what ifs. Right? You know, what if I turn this producer into an injector? What if I drill a new well here? What if I use this stimulation technique? Right? What if I use this tertiary re recovery scheme? Well, which tertiary re recovery scheme is better? Should I flood with some surfactant, use steam? Right? So there's lots of options. And what the reservoir simulator allows to do is test those options on a model. Right? And so these are the type of questions that we, we want to answer. And again, what we're trying to answer always in this scenario is, how much oil can I produce from the reservoir, and how fast can I produce it? And how economically can I produce it? And that really is our engineering problem. So this is sort of a generic flow chart for engineering models and simulation. Right? So our, our engineering problem are, is essentially the, the, to gain information so that we can answer those two questions. And the first step is really the hardest, to go from, you know, what do we need to answer those questions and write down a mathematical model? Right? Now, in this class, we're sort of going to do that for you. Right? I mean, we're going to say we're going to focus our study on single phase and multi phase flow. Right? Uh, you know, and not even just multi phase flow, but black oil model. Right? We're not going to do compositional flow or anything like that. Um, we'll discuss it some, but you know, we're not going to be expected to say write a compositional simulator. Okay? But in, re in the real world, this is the hard, hardest problem, uh, is, you know, and this is really what separates engineers from, say, physicists. So the physicists, you know, they want to they wanna know where every atom is in everything in the world at all times. Right? Well, as an engineer, we have to answer questions. That's not practical to track every atom in the world. Right? So we have to throw out some of the physics. We, we know that everything is made of atoms, but in, we sort of disregard that, and we model it as a continuous something. And we write down mathematical equations. So, um, so the first step is really what sep separates the engineers from the physicists or other trained scientists. And now, you know, as engineers, or in this class, we have a mathematical model uh, to solve the problem. And so then, we'll, the, really, the focus of this class is going to be this step here. Okay. So it's going to be how do we take that mathematical model and compute a numerical solution? So how do we take those partial differential equations, which have smooth answers? Right? They have to have, they're, they're partial differential equations, right? What I mean by smooth is that they have to have derivatives, right? You can't have a, you can't have a solution to a PDE that's not smooth enough such that the derivatives exist, right? So they have smooth solutions, but we're going to break it up. We're going to discretize it. We're going to take that smooth thing and break it up into discrete chunks, and then those discrete chunks will become a set of algebraic equations that we can solve on a computer, right? And so that's really the task at hand here in this class. The primary discretization tool we're going to use in this class is something called finite differences. Well, you probably all learned that in 310, right, when you took the, you know, the MATLAB class. Right? You, you computed, you, you used finite differences to compute derivatives of functions, right? You had to, right? Remember central difference or Euler forward, Euler backwards? Right? You, you had to have done that. Right? And so we're going to use finite differences as the primary tool in this class, but it's not the only means of discretization a reservoir. There's also other things, and maybe late in the class we'll discuss them as kind of special topics. So these would be like things like finite volumes or the finite element method. Okay. Turns out the finite element method is sort of what my background and expertise is in. Okay. Um, and it has some advantages, but also a little more complexity. The finite difference is sort of the, the simplest thing you can do. Okay. So then we compute the numerical solution, then we essentially need to interpret the results and Answer, you know, close the loop, right? Do, try to try to answer our original engineering problem, and then, you know, if if we can't come to an adequate solution, then we sort of start over. Maybe we need to add more physics, right? Maybe we can't get a solution in a reasonable amount of time because at the beginning we we put in too much physics, and our code runs for you know 20 days on a thousand processors, and that's not acceptable because we need an answer in a week. So then we close the loop. We go back. We say, okay, what's the least important thing here? Let's, let's remove those physics. 
make our mathematical model simpler and try again. Right? So this is sort of the process of computer simulation in engineering. So I think this mostly just uh, sort of reiterates some of the things I already said. You know, all the steps are important. We, we have to understand the physics so that we can describe the, the mathematics. Now, you've already got enough in your toolbox to do this, okay? Um, so there's, there's assumptions in the physics in terms of, you know, what we're going to include or exclude, okay? There's also assumptions in the numerics, okay? So one of those assumptions, for example, in the finite differences that we're going to use in this class is that we essentially break our reservoir up into discrete blocks. And in physical scale, those blocks could be the size of this room, right? Because you have a reservoir that's kilometers long. So your, your discrete blocks could be the size of this room. And again, we're going to assign one permeability, one porosity to them, right? And we're going to compute one pressure and one saturation. But that's an assumption, right? Because clearly, the room's not homogeneous and have one value, right? And this is where the more advanced techniques like, say, finite elements. Because in finite elements, you actually would introduce an interpolation across the room, right? So it's just important to understand the assumptions that go not only into the physics, but into the numerics, right? So we're going to take um, you know, our, our heterogeneous reservoir, and we're going to break it up into a bunch of blocks that might look like this Rubik's Cube, where all the colors on the Rubik's Cube represent single-valued permeability, porosity, right? material properties, material and fluid properties, OK? And um, by the way, all these techniques sort of in the limit in the limit of making these blocks smaller and smaller and smaller would approach the exact solution, right? The exact solution being the real solution to the PDE, which of course we don't know always because it's too complicated. But in the limit, uh, as we make the blocks blocks smaller and we introduce more data, then we should approach the exact solution. So another part of this sort of engineering cycle is to determine what's good enough, right? I could go on refining this to be infinitely small, but every time I do that, I increase the size of the problem that I have to solve. And that increases the time it takes to get a solution. Right? So as engineers and numerical analysts, we're always trading off sort of speed for accuracy for stability. Right? And we have to be engineers and decide what is the best. What's the best solution given the constraints that we have. Right? And so that's just sort of uh, reiterates the last point there. The mass solution and the engineering solution requires economics, experience, and good decision-making skills. Okay? And so, I think the next slide, pretty much I already said what, what we do there. We, on the left there, we have a reservoir. The colors that you see there, you see this very smooth transition. It's a very gradual change from hot to warm colors. So what that represents, this would be something that, say, for somebody who's an expert in formation evaluation would give you, as a reservoir engineer, would give to you, and then you have to discretize it. So you take those colors represent per, uh, permeability, right? So red being high, blue being low permeability. And so you'd, you'd take that thing and you'd break it up and do a discrete set of chunks, assigning values in some way, you know, interpolating in some way to take the data that's there and assign it to those values, okay? Then we're going to write algebraic equations for each of those. And these are called grid blocks when you're talking about finite differences. So, so each of these are called grid blocks. We're going to write equations for the pressure and saturation and such on each block. And of course, there's communication between the blocks, right? If fluid's going out of this room into the next, this is our grid block, right? So if fluid's going out of this room into the next, then the, the, the room next to it is gaining fluid, right? And so there's, there's communication between the grid blocks, and that couples the equations, right, between all the grid blocks, and creates a system of coupled equations that we then solve as a linear system, okay? So you've probably seen this before. I mean, the, the primary equation that we're going to deal with in this class is conservation of mass. Right? This is probably the, the primary equation of all of petroleum engineering, although you know, for more accuracy, we, we may need to do conservation of energy solutions simultaneously, flash calculations, fluid thermodynamics. If you're talking about unconventionals, you might want to couple geomechanics, so you have to solve momentum equation as well. So uh, you know, but in traditional reservoir simulation, we're just solving conservation of mass, right? And in words, that's just the rate of mass into a block uh, minus the rate of mass out of the block has to equal its accumulation in the absence of sources, which would be like a well, right? Or producing an injector, sources or sinks. And so, well, 
why was that written? Anyway, uh, so we're going to write those equations for pressure and saturation for every component. So when we're talking about multi-phase, you know, uh, and, and all we'll do in this class is black well model. So we're not going to balance on methane, butane, you know, every, say, gaseous phase you could have. We're just going to say we're going to lump all the components and call them phases, and those phases will be oily, gaseous, and aqueous. That's the most complicated thing we're going to do on this, in this class. But when we do that, we'll, we will then write the mass balance equations for each of those, and you'll see that the, they're coupled, right? And we're going to do it for each cell, each grid block. And so in the end, in 1D, this is for two-phase system, oil and water, in 1D, you're going to get that set of differential equations. So you know, they are coupled. And they're PDEs. They have spatial dependence and a time dependence. Okay? And in general, they have variable properties. So the mobilities there uh, include functions of relative permeabilities, right? And those can vary as we go through the reservoir. Okay? But when we apply the transformation, the disc discretization, to take that continuous equation to a discrete one, what we end up with is something that's algebraic like this. Okay? And so in this case, what the unknown are the pressures that we want to solve for. Um, this is called a transmissibility matrix. We'll learn how to define that in this class, OK? And so uh, what you'll notice is that all of these matrix, and, and this is in 1D. In 1D, it, it always has structure like this. It always, in 1D, it'll always be tridiagonal. In 2D, it'll be pentadiagonal, OK? And so it always has some structure. And these matrices can be big, because remember, each row of this matrix represents one equation. Right? And so if single phase and all you're solving for is pressure, then you know, for every grid block, you're, you're going to have an equation. It's not unusual to have millions of grid blocks. In fact, I think Saudi Aramco has a reservoir model that has a billion. Right? So a billion grid blocks, that's a billion equations for single phase flow. Then you add in two phase flow, and that's two billion. Right? And so these things can be very, very large, but thankfully, they're very sparse. In other words, the, the, the entries that are not included here are just zero. And we're not going to concern ourselves with it in this class so much. Uh, but if you were going to write a commercial reservoir simulator, uh, then you would sort of write it in a way that the data structures employ the, the, some metadata such that you don't actually store the zeros. You just store the non-zero values and some metadata about where they occur. And therefore, you can write even big, big matrices that you know, have, they may, they may have billions of rows, but, but they have only millions of non-zero entries. And so you just store that big. By the way, I, you know, I mentioned commercial reservoir simulator. I meant to ask real early on in the talk, but did, did any of you have internships and use uh, commercial reservoir simulator? Um, or did anybody have any experience using commercial reservoir simulator? What, what did you use? OK. Anybody else? Yeah. So the two, the two sort of big ones uh, that sort of probably own between the two of them 80% of the market share are Eclipse, which comes from Schlumberger, and CMG. Right? And CMG is name of the company also. Right? So in this class, we're actually going to use CMG more and more towards the end of the class. Okay? Uh, early on, we're going to focus on the equation. We're going to write our own simulator. And your midterm project, what you'll see is that uh, your simulator will produce the exact output that, that CMG produces. Okay? So what tools do you need to create your own simulator? Well, you, you already have them, right? The equations for fluid transport, you know. You've taken four classes, at least, that dealt in that, right? Uh, that I can think of off the top of my head, probably more. Um, the methods of numerical analysis. So this is the, the stuff that you learned in 310, which you probably all remember as the MATLAB class. Does there, anybody remember anything from 310 aside from how, they, how much they hated MATLAB? And do you remember actually any of the methods? Do you remember root finding or? Solving systems of equations or anything like that, or you just remember hating math. <coughs> okay. uh, so a good time to just say, there's a few of you that have had classes from me before. Uh, in any class that you take from me, I'm going to force you to compute. You got to write code, because real problems don't have, you know, real problems in the real world. Uh, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and in mechanical engineering, we always, we always simplify everything to like a, like a, everything in the world is like a spring mass damper, right? 
So no matter how complex something is, you have a little dash pot, you have a spring, and you have a mass, right? And then if you just start stacking these things up to add complexity, you do that enough, you can describe anything in the world. Okay. The, the reality is when you go open your car, like you go up and you open the hood on your car, it doesn't look like that. Right? You don't see a bunch of spring, mass spring dampers in there. And that, that's the reality sort of he, here too, that you know, real world problems don't have solutions that you can just write down the answer to. If they, if they do, they're not problems. They're, they're solutions. They're handbooks, right? <laughs> right? So when you're faced with an engineering challenge at this point, there's very, very few problems that you can just solve. Right? You have to resort to the computer. And even if it is simple enough that you can solve it, you can't always explore the parametric space like you can on a computer. You might have a thousand inputs and you want to see sort of how variations in those inputs. There's no way you can do that by hand, right? So the point is, if you had a class from me before, like reservoir geomechanics, that is not reservoir geomechanics simulation. That's just reservoir sim geomechanics. And I made you compute in that class. Think about how much co code you're going to have to write in this class. Reservoir simulation. It's in the title. We're going to write a lot of code in this class, okay? So be ready, right? And the, it's really stacked at the front. The class actually gets easier in the second half when we're going to learn C and G, okay? So be ready, keep up, and you know, I'll give you some tips here in a minute. <coughs> How many of you are MATLAB experts? No one, okay. <laughs> How many of you know some other computer language well? What do you, what do you like? Java. Okay, that's not a good language for scientific computing. You're a, you're a web developer or what? No, I just, I just do Okay. What about? Oh, that's an awful language for scientific computing. <laughs> Worse. Can you, you have your hand up? Yeah. I, I can do C, but. Okay, C is okay. And C is kind of ancient at this point, right? So uh, most modern software, you know, high performance sort of software is a, is a superset of C called C, right? Adds object orientation and all that. My favorite get something done today language is Python. I love Python. Right? So I, I don't, I rarely use MATLAB, even though I, I can use it fine. Uh, I rarely use it for sort of get something done today. I use Python. Um, I also know C++, Fortran, C. Uh, I know a little bit of Java. I know about 15 different languages. Right? Um, so with that in mind, the code that we're going to write in this class, I don't care what language you use. Um, if you can do it in Excel, I don't think you're going to be able to write the code we're going to have to write in this class in Excel. But if you think you can do it in Excel, have at it. Right? That's not really the point. I don't want to force you to use, you know, you have to use MATLAB. I suspect most of you are going to use a MATLAB because that's, that's what you know or what you've had some exposure to. And that's perfectly fine. And I'm, you know, I can help you. The TAs can help you. But just know that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm sort of language agnostic. The, these languages are computer coding systems are just, they're, they're just tools that you use to solve the problem. Right? The goal is not to be an expert in MATLAB or, or any, any particular computer. Okay, so we're going to write a lot of code in this class. So why? Why do we have to write the code, Dr. Foster? Uh, somebody already wrote Eclipse, CMG, why can't I just use that? Well, the problem is that there's a lot of danger in that. And it goes back to this, all these assumptions, right? There's assumptions in the physics, there's assumptions in the numerics, and all those assumptions can stack up to give vastly different or bad answers if you don't really understand them, right? And I've been doing this kind of work for, like I said, 15 or 16 years, and we have a, I used to work at Sandia National Labs, it's a government research lab, sort of known for supercomputing, and we, we always have an expression, it's garbage in, garbage out. You don't want to be a garbage in, garbage out analyst, right? In other words, you know, you just put garbage in, the computer's going to compute something, and you have garbage on the other side, right? You want to have enough confidence. You want to know enough about the simulation code. You want to have enough confidence that you can decide for yourself if it's correct, right? I mean, I still, to this day, I have graduate students that come to me and they give me results, and they just don't even make sense. And they just sometimes have no intuition, right? So you got to use your intuition. You got to know, use your, what you know about the physics, right? For example, this is kind of too simple of an example, but nevertheless, if I have a, if I have a reservoir, and I have no, there's, you know, it's, it's completely sealed on all sides, and I have one injector into it, and I inject fluid into it, what's the pressure going to do? It's going to go up, right? 
So if the simulator is telling you it's going down, there's something wrong. Right? There's a bug in your code or something. But I regularly see, I mean, not quite that simple, but I regularly see people present results that are clearly wrong, and it's because they don't understand enough about sort of the internals and the assumptions that they're making to make, to, to sort of know that it's, that it, that it's wrong, right? And so that, that, that's sort of the, the first two points there. The second thing, you know, I mean, or the third point is, you know, understanding the math and the physics is what makes us engineers, right? Otherwise, I mean, you could train anybody just, well, you click that button and you open this and you click that button, which is a sort of what you do in these reservoir simulators. I mean, we're, we're going to use CMG in this class, but, you know, we're not trying to make you an expert in CMG. We want to, all these reservoir simulators sort of have the same, you know, you set up the problem in a certain way, you run the, run the code, and then it produces a certain output that you, you know, a certain expected output. And really just finding, you know, where you input, which button you click to input permeability versus porosity, that may vary from simulator to simulator, but you know, sort of anybody can learn that, right? It's not, that's not really relevant, okay? It's sort of back to, it's the same point I was kind of leading to uh, when I was talking about the different computer codes, right? Python, MATLAB, C, it doesn't, the language is just syntax. You can Google syntax. It's, it's the logic of programming and the structure. That's what matters, right? And, you know, the last point, you might be the guy writing the next simulator. So you're all seniors. Is anybody considering going to graduate school? A couple, a couple of people, right? So whether you go to the graduate school in, in this department or another one, I mean, if you're going to be an engineer, uh, at that level, most of the science is being conducted, unless you're going to be an experimentalist, right? But, uh, you know, if you're going to do sort of uh, theory and, and compute, you know, theory often leads to computation now because the theories are getting so complex that the only way you can solve the problems is to compute a solution to it. And in that case, you're going to be writing your own code, writing your own simulators, right? And if you go to graduate school in this department, I mean, this department has a long history of reservoir simulation development. It goes back 30 years, right? And so it may be you. You may go work for CMG or Eclipse. Um, we've had students come out of these classes uh, that went and worked for companies that do reservoir simulation development because of what they learned here. Um, that's just a sort of pretty picture that comes from CMG, uh, not, not that important. So the, uh, the last thing is just, you know, some categories of reservoir simulators. So I, we already talked about CMG and Eclipse being the most popular. There are some other ones, Intersect, which is a collaboration between Schlumberger and Chevron. Basically every major, uh, every super major company, every large service company is going to have their own in-house simulators. And, you know, ultimately th they all solve the same equations for the most part. There might be some equations of state or something that's proprietary because these companies pay to develop uh, the experimental data or something. Or sometimes these in-house simulators will actually include the data in the simulator for certain fields or whatever. And that's why they don't want to sell them or give them away because, because it's sort of in integrated into the, into the code. Uh, so those are, and then of course, uh, the academic simulators. Like I said, UT Chem's been developed here in our department for 30 years. IPARS also in our department from Mary Wheeler's group, GPASS. Uh, is a compositional simulator uh, for Kami Sepinori's group. Tough 2 is an open source um, simulator from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Okay, so uh, that's sort of an introduction to reservoir simulation. And we'll talk more about sort of the logistics of how this class is run. So I, I put this up, I don't know if you probably haven't had a chance to look, but put this up on Canvas last night. And, uh, you know, your syllabus is there. If you click on it, the, the main thing, there's just another link. I just sort of have a very streamlined way that I can put things up on the web quickly, and it doesn't necessarily involve Canvas, so I link out of it. But, but the syllabus is there, okay? Uh, so I'm teaching two sections. I teach in the morning and the afternoon. So there's two course numbers there. Yours is the second, 19070. There are two teaching assistants that should be here any minute. I told them 2.30 so that you can see who they are. So we'll wait until they come in to say more about them. Um, there's no book for this class, OK? So uh, most of the reservoir simulation books are outdated. There's a bunch of references there. Um, sorry, let me stop something real quick. 